One of the major events in Kenya this year has been the discovery of oil in Trukana. The benefits of this discovery will take time to be realized and as many Kenyans wait to reap those benefits, they are aware of the ongoing war against Al-Shabaab militants in Somalia since October 2011. President Mwai Kibaki, who is retiring after his current term, will not be in power when Kenya starts exporting oil. It would be too ambitious to expect the end of the war against Al-Shabaab by the end of Kibaki's term. But it is during Kibaki's last term that four Kenyans were accused of committing crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. So what will be Kibaki's legacy and what are the implications of oil discovery? What has been the role of International Criminal Court in Africa and more so in Kenya after the 2007-2008 election violence? To provide insights to these questions, I spoke with Professor Ali Mazrui, a Kenyan intellectual giant and a global African, when I visited his residence in Binghamton in the state of New York. I started by asking Professor Mazrui what this recent oil discovery in different parts of Africa meant for the continent. Quite a number of countries all of a sudden discovered a resource which was there all the time. Uh, so at least half a dozen African countries have become oil producers within the last 10 years. Uh, uh, and uh, one suspects some kind of conspiracy on the part of the established petroleum companies uh, originally to uh, disguise the availability of additional resources in Africa. This is Tolo's first well in your country. So we have, no, we have never drilled a well here before. Others have in different places, in different basins. And alas, nothing has been found. Uh, in West Africa, they've been discovering oil in Ghana, in Liberia, etc. All of a sudden, mainly because, I, I would imagine, of the escalating demand of the newly emerging uh, big powers like China and India and Brazil. So they are beginning to need uh, more energy resources. And so new oil fields are being discovered to meet that need. So there's a, some cynicism in the way it has gone that uh, we were kept in the dark about its availability until now. It's a very rare event for a, an exploration well in a new frontier like this to be a success. We are really pinching ourselves with this result. The challenge with petroleum is that it imposes considerable responsibility on the country producing it, especially if it is a developing country that has not yet established a stable democratic order. If you discover oil after you have become uh, stable as a democracy, like Norway or Scotland, etc., uh, then the oil could help the democratic order, could provide greater uh, economic justice for poorer, poorer citizens and improve participation. This is if the oil comes after stabilization and democratization. But if the oil, as in most of Africa, comes before the countries have been stabilized or democratized, I think they will cause complications in those processes. Yeah. Since discovery of natural resources in Africa has often triggered political instability, the Kenyan government will have to be cautious to avoid both national and international problems. So it's a big responsibility. Uh, we hope we will control our appetites sufficiently uh, to be able to take advantage of the resource without endangering uh, fairness in governance. Failure to control our appetite may potentially cause internal instability and generate international conflicts, limiting our capacity to exploit the discovered resources. It is already happening in the Middle East, and while Kenya's circumstances are different, Professor Mazrui suggests the need to be on the surveillance. In the Middle East, oil has caused 
a lot of international problems as well as inadequate inter internal stability. It has attracted uh, major conflicts uh, between Arab countries and Western countries. So we're not there yet, yeah? so we're not in a situation where our own resources trigger international wars. Uh, let us hope we don't re reach that situation, uh, but it is the sort of thing that could happen and we should be on the alert accordingly. And on the alert we are. <laughs> if not in the oil fields, in the battlegrounds, fighting Al-Shabaab militants in Somalia since October 2011, the Kenyan government has vowed to continue its military engagement in Somalia until the militants are subdued. But Professor Mazurui suggested that the government should have adopted other strategies rather than military in dealing with Al-Shabaab. He fears that a military approach would trigger revenge attacks by Al-Shabaab and by other militant Somalis. It is true with conventional weapons, uh, there's not much of a Somali army to fight, so Kenya prevails, but the situation with Somalia is not conventional warfare, is whether we increase the probability of terrorism in the streets of Nairobi, uh, Mombasa and Kisumu. So I was very worried about the military response uh, to our predicament. It's very tempting. The United States makes the same mistake time and time again. You're faced with a problem, use military force. I don't know where that has got the United States. Professor Mazrui recommends committed efforts in search of other non-military solutions, especially to our new challenges on the fight against Al-Shabaab. We should find uh, other solutions uh, uh, when we're confronted with this new phenomenon of armed um, rebellion, uh, either in our own country or in neighboring country. Uh, sending in our army increases the probability that they will fight back. Uh, fight back, a lot of innocent people will die in the streets of Nairobi. <laughs> kutisha watu wetu na kutia hofu kwa watu wetu. But according to President Mwai Kibaki, the security of our country will not be achieved through military force alone. All citizens have been called upon to play a crucial role in ensuring that no one among them is used to disrupt peace and stability. But it is precisely peace and stability that were disrupted during the 2007 2008 election violence, prompting the International Criminal Court to summon four Kenyans to answer charges for allegedly committing crimes against humanity. While Professor Mazroy acknowledges the role the International Criminal Court has played in African politics, he is critical of its performance. I'm an internationalist, yeah? uh, so uh, I, I do think uh, we should have systems of justice uh, which uh, demand accountability uh, from governments and uh, political elites uh, in different countries. Mr. Taylor, for the foregoing reasons, the trial chamber unanimously sentences you to a single term of imprisonment of 50 years for all of the counts on which you've been found guilty. I'm um, perturbed that uh, the ICC is still in a situation where the people it targets are disproportionately developing countries and African countries at that. You see. So, um, uh, it's a form of justice that is uneven. But in general, I think the trend towards creating judicial institutions of global accountability is a progressive step in the history of the world. And with regards to Kenya's failed shuttle diplomacy that sought to defer cases from the International Criminal Court? We don't want to pull out of the world, we Kenyans. We don't want to pull out of the world 
on the eve of celebrating our 50th anniversary of independence. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't make sense. We have had good standing in the international community. We should save that standing as we approach the second half century uh, of our independence. Yeah. Uh, but I realize that uh, it's very uh, annoying very often that uh, Africans are disproportionately targeted uh, by ICC just by the nature of world politics yeah. uh, and uh, I wish they would have the courage also to indict some big powers who also commit atrocities uh, uh, and should be punished. Uh, but uh, ICC is not there yet. <laughs> it hasn't found the will <laughs> to provoke big powers. Uh, but I think the institution itself is a progressive step in the history of the world. Well, it is the election crisis of 2007-2008 that invited the ICC to Kenya. The country is on the verge of holding another general election, and Professor Mazrui hopes that Kenya will exhibit more maturity as a young democracy by having free, fair and peaceful elections this time. Uh, well, we do have uh, touch and go with regard to the elections, partly because of the uh, disagreements with, uh, which has arisen over uh, the International Criminal Court. Uh, I was hoping myself that we would stabilize uh, a system whereby uh, we had an executive prime minister and an executive president, and the and the executive prime minister would be answerable to parliament and not answerable to the head of state. Uh, so I had proposed that particular solution uh, when we were drifting towards the civil war uh, in 2008. Uh, and, and then uh, it uh, gradually, at first, both sides rejected having a second executive position in addition to the presidency. And then it turned out to be the only realistic compromise in the situation uh, when uh, Kofi Annan was ready to run with that solution. Yeah. I still think we should stick with it, yeah, after all. It has survived in France since 1958, yeah, having an executive president and an executive prime minister. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the style they have in Russia where the two people just keep on exchanging. <laughs> the prime minister and the president keep on exchanging roles. As a, uh, but uh, the French situation, which was inaugurated by Charles de Gaulle in 1958, has survived better than almost any other French system since the French Revolution of 1789. So we could try it and, and see whether we can make a success of it. It's true, it's very hard because we are still an ethnic-prone country. We have never been coup-prone, but we have always been ethnic-prone in our politics. Such ethnic-prone politics have defined and negatively affected our national fabric since independence. All Kenyan presidents have been haunted by the politics of ethnicity. But at independence, historical circumstances might have judged Mze Njomo Kenyatta differently. <laughs> Special just because of this, the first decade of independence, uh, uh, and we had a leader who uh, who enjoyed uh, a lot of legitimacy 
in the society as as a whole, uh, and uh, we had international support uh, uh, that was uh, above average uh, among newly independent African countries. So the Kenyatta years uh, were especially in that sense. We didn't use them wisely, yeah, but they were nevertheless special. Yeah, so from 1963 to 1978, those were important uh, uh, days in the history of Kenya. If the country failed to thrive during the regime of Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, it had drifted into an abyss of ineptitude during the reigns of President Dani Arab Moy when he came to power in 1978. But Professor Mazroui sees our national failures as having preceded Moy's presidency. When uh, Moy came to power, uh, the deterioration had already started, you see. So it got worse during the years of Moy and uh, imprisonment with without trial, uh, the flight of left-wing uh, Kenyans to seek uh, asylum elsewhere. Uh, and the, the beginning of the neglect of a higher educational institution. We have increased them quantitatively, uh, but we have uh, diluted them qualitatively. Uh, so the level of quality of education, of lab, libraries, uh, and of time for research for academics in Kenya has deteriorated. So the number of universities has multiplied. Well, it was during Mze Jomo Kenyatta's regime that Professor Mazrui was informed by the late Professor Josphat Karanja that he could not teach at the University of Nairobi. It was during Moy's regime that he was denied opportunities to give lectures in Kenyan universities. Under Moy, uh, I was uh, uh, under a cloud, political cloud, constantly. Uh, uh, and although I was allowed to come in and out of the country, uh, universities were uh, intimidated, uh, and I could lecture all over the world. But no Kenyan university invited me in the final years of Moy's rule. Uh, so the, 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 in general, consensus among university administrators that I was a political risk to, <laughs> to invite to give a lecture. <laughs> uh. I, Mwai Kibaki. But it is President Mwai Kibaki who opened up previously muted discursive spaces in the country allowing different and multiple voices to compete in a relatively freer marketplace of ideas. One of the legacies of uh, Kibaki was to open up the system, you see, so, uh, so that universities could have a freer choice of whom they want to invite. Uh, the situation also allowed uh, greater openness in the newspapers. Uh, with more often debate than there had been before. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then in the case of my own self, uh, I was more or less restored uh, to legitimacy. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, uh, not only uh, allowed to publish in Kenyan newspapers more than I was in the final years of Moi, uh, uh, I was also able to lecture and I was invited to be chancellor of one of the universities. Uh, and the chancellor from abroad, costing every time I went to Kenya, it cost us thousands of dollars for my round trip airfare. Uh, so it was a major gesture uh, of, the, of the government to try, to try and make up for the years when I was and the cloud. You know, uh, uh, so that, that was a major plus from my uh, point of view uh, of the opening up of Kenya uh, in the Kibaki era. Is it too early to provide a report card on President Kibaki's performance during his two presidential terms? Uh, it's still 
uh, an incomplete story. Uh, it's a work of art yet to be fini finished and to be assessed uh, properly. Uh, but it did signify uh, opening up of the country. While celebrating Kibaki's effort in opening up the country, Professor Mazrui suggests that Kibaki's legacy will be burdened by the 2007-2008 election conflicts which nearly condemned the country into a genocide. We made a mess of the elections of 2007-2008. Uh, uh, we made a mess, we were on the verge of making history uh, uh, by having demonstrably free elections uh, and the parliamentary ones were indisputably free. Uh, the presidential ones were much more controversial uh, because they didn't seem to uh, tally with what appeared to be the outrage of the Kenyan people. Yeah. Uh, so so we, uh, we messed it up. I was hoping it would be a new demonstration of uh, growing maturation as a young democracy. Uh, but that went overboard. Uh, now we have about another test, test coming up about our maturation as democracy, and we'll see whether we do better this time. And who is Professor Mazrui's favorite candidate in the coming elections? <laughs> uh, no, I, I avoided that, especially from as long as I'm not in the country, in the country to be uh, constantly reminded of the clashes of politics and debates, you see. Uh, so because of that, I have avoided having specific preferences. Uh, and then for until the new constitution, which is hopefully going to allow absentee voting. Uh, most of the time, uh, I've been in foreign lands when Kenyans have been voting. Uh, let us hope uh, we will allow the diaspora to participate uh, in future elections uh, more realistically. Mwalimu Mazrui hopes that the painful lessons of the 2007-2008 crisis will serve to remind all Kenyans, home and abroad, that our nation's stability depends on every citizen's eternal vigilance, for that is the price of liberty. After all, it is the future of our country that is at stake. I am Dirango Wachanga.